This is May 16th, 2006. We're doing another oral history interview. Our visitor this morning is Spike Field. I'm Charles Lundquist. Spike, it's good to have you here. It's good to be here, Chuck. We often start out by letting you say a few words about where you spent your youth, uh, where you went to school, and how you got into the space program here in Huntsville. Okay. Well, I was born in uh, a small town in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, Ramsey. Uh, grew up there, went to schools there. Uh, I was a minor actor in uh, the sport field, a uh, major one in Boy Scouts, and eventually earned a, uh, an Eagle Scout. Uh, and then uh, at the age of 17, right after high school, I enlisted in the Navy. and. Uh, uh, it was a minority cruise back in those days. I guess they still have it. You have to be discharged before you're 21. And uh, during the uh, course of my career in the Navy, I became a frogman, and uh, I um, and and that was a high one of one of one of the high points of my life was being a frogman. Um, we went to the Persian Gulf before it became popular. Uh, the uh, uh, it was recons uh, do, doing uh, 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 under, underwater surveys. And uh, then uh, another event was to go to uh, the Ar Arctic Ocean. Got to swim up there, too. Uh, cold water, I take it. It was very cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you get chilled to the point where your temperature drops, and then uh, uh, it takes a long while to warm up. Anyway, after uh, uh, discharge, uh, oh, while I was in the Navy, uh, uh, I married my uh, childhood sweetheart, uh, Betty Sutherland, uh, and, and we've now been married, what, uh, 57, going on 58 years. Anyway, uh, uh, after discharge, uh, we went down uh, from New Jersey uh, uh, to Atlanta. I went to Georgia Tech for four years and uh, got a degree in... in, in Bachelor of Industrial Engineering. What year was that? I uh, graduated in 54. And then I um, uh, got a job with 3M Company in Chattanooga in a subsidiary called American Lava Corporation. Uh, we made technical ceramics, uh, uh, titanates, steatites, uh, aluminas, all for the uh, technical industry. And uh, my job was to a project uh, engineer in the grinding room, uh, grinding, uh, precision grinding of ceramics with diamond wheels, <laughs> which which was uh, uh, it was a fun job. Uh, but along about uh, that time, our our three kids who were all born while we were at Tech uh, were starting in school, and uh, I felt a need to. Uh, 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 advanced uh, to a, a little uh, higher uh, salary and an I can understand that and an opportunity arose in uh, Huntsville Alabama so I came down for an interview and in, uh, I guess it was uh, gee I think it was January late January before uh, the Explorer was launched 58 that would be 58 for an interview and uh, good grief it took several months and finally an offer came and they said can you come down immediately heck no <laughs> I gotta give two weeks notice so uh, I, I, it was a thrill to join the uh, ABM, ABMA organization uh, they, uh, I went right into George Constant's office program coordination office and we uh, we had our office on the third floor, the same floor, the same wing as Von Braun, uh, and we could look out the window at the test stands and watch all the uh, test activity. Uh, so uh, my job was to uh, go out into the, uh, uh, <laughs> into the labs, and uh, the first job was to uh, review with them uh, unsatisfactory condition reports, UCRs. You remember them? Yes. Yes. So uh, that was uh, that was that was a great way to meet folks out in the labs, and then uh, during management the, by walking around. Yes, yes, exactly. 
and then the uh, uh, Saturn uh, uh, program, uh, not a program, it was a study by uh, ARPA that was funded, and we immediately went into designing uh, the, the, the kludge of, of redstone and, and a Jupiter tank to make a Saturn booster. And uh, that was the, uh, the onset, the, the beginning, the genesis of the Saturn program. So we, uh, we, we started up a, what they call the Saturn Systems Office in 1959. Uh, and uh, Von Braun persuaded uh, Oswald Longa to come over. And uh, Longa headed up the office. Uh, it was a very small group. We started out, uh, let's see, it was Max Smith, uh, uh, there was uh, Bill Griever, uh, Bob Lindstrom, uh, oh golly, uh, uh, That's uh, a Bill Ferguson. Stellar, pretty stellar list already. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, it was uh, it was all it was a very exciting time because uh, of the interaction between uh, what was going on in the labs uh, and what was going on in Washington and how uh, Washington uh, uh, really enabled us uh, to uh, move ahead with this thing. And I, I give the, the biggest credit from a, uh, a management political uh, viewpoint uh, to uh, uh, Jim Webb. Uh, he, he was the one who got the money. Of Jim was a very fine administrator. Yeah. And he... Uh, of course, he was a, a big friend of Lyndon Johnson, so that didn't hurt any. Yeah. <laughs> and the program developed, and uh, uh, I, I was my, my involvement at that time was to uh, uh, help write the model specifications for the stages. And the first one we did was the S4 stage, and the S4 stage uh, uh, only uh, flew on the uh, Saturn uh, One vehicle, uh, and uh, it. Uh, it, it set the mo it, it set the model for writing more model yeah. specs for the S2, uh, and people probably forget we had an S5 at one time, it never went anywhere, and the S4B. So uh, I was involved in all those model spec uh, uh, writings, uh, and uh, and then came the source evaluation. Uh, go ahead uh, to. Uh, move out with contracts for Saturn. And I got involved with the Source Evaluation Board. Uh, as, as that ties you up for a long time, as I remember. Yes. And <laughs> that experience, unfortunately, resulted in being on account SEPs. <laughs> the, um, uh, the first one, of course, was the S4. That uh, award was made to uh, uh, Douglas at the time. And uh, then uh, uh, that was followed with uh, the S2, uh, which uh, went out on bid. We had four major contractors uh, apply. Uh, North American was named, and incidentally, the, the, the same week that, that S2 was named, Apollo was named for North American, which we could never understand. Uh, Except from a standpoint that maybe somebody up in Washington figured that uh, 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 if all this work were in one contractor, the the burden rate would be lower and it'd cost less. Fallacious idea. <laughs> <laughs> but but there, 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 I'm sure there were other um, ideas behind why they did that. Uh, but it was uh, it was a sort of an albatross too, uh, having two huge contracts in one shop in Downey. Uh, S two was a uh, uh, the first huge liquid hydrogen uh, oxygen stage. It had five J two engines, a million pounds of thrust. Uh, nothing like that had been done before. Uh, it was in uh, the engineering was to be done by North American at Downey. Uh, they proposed building a manufacturing facility at Seal Beach, and they also proposed testing this huge monster up in the Santa Susana Mountains, which obviously uh, uh, fell by the wayside in a hurry uh, once uh, the Stennis, uh, or the Mississippi test facility came on. 
So it was uh, it, w- it was an exciting uh, time. Well, while the stage was being designed and built, what was your function? Then? Well, I was uh, named acting project manager at the very start uh, when we were operating, uh, uh, building the model specs and, and going out uh, on uh, bids and uh, negotiating the contract. Um, it was, uh, uh, we, we had a small office, started out with, uh, uh, well, I guess within the first year we had two secretaries and maybe five guys in the project office. and. Uh, uh, I, it was it was my privilege to have some of the best best men at Marshall working uh, on that project. Well, Don Bowden came on uh, and he got assigned out to the uh, resident office. Um, Jim Odom and uh, Porter Bridwell, mm-hmm. Charlie Cox. Uh, that was basically you had a stellar crew. group. Yeah, yeah, and without them, um, uh, I, I think uh, we would have. Um, Stumbled a few times, but I don't think we did. We we went through that whole process and uh, and got the contract started and uh, and and the development started. Any interesting events during the development that's oh, worth yeah. mentioning? <laughs> uh, well, that's that's too had uh, uh, a number of interesting uh, <laughs> problems. I, I'll say problems, but uh, they were they were eventually solved. Uh, number one, it it had a common bulkhead uh, between the oxygen tank and the and the hydrogen tank, and this beast was 30, uh, 320 inches in diameter, uh, uh, and to make a uh, and and the design that was proposed we carried through with it was an ellipsoid uh, oxygen tank, the uh, and making the. Uh, the eight petals, uh, triangular petals that form the that ellipsoid bulkhead uh, uh, was quite a job, and we eventually, uh, after messing around with a propo- the proposed uh, route of doing explosive forming by rocketine, uh, that fell out. Uh, so we went to uh, uh, Nor- uh, North American uh, uh, down at uh, the. Uh, Airport. Uh, oh, I forget what they call the division, um, but it was the or, original place where they they, ma- they made their airplanes. And we ran across a guy uh, who had been involved early on in uh, 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 manufacturing uh, uh, aluminum. Uh, oh, can you believe it? With with shot bags, he formed SO aluminum with shot bags. You, Peened it out with with bags full of lead, huh. uh, and uh, th- that's where he got started. Well, he had some brilliant ideas to to make these uh, uh, triangular uh, uh, petals that uh, form the bulkhead, and uh, uh, he suggested that we uh, uh, get some T1 steel that was used in submarine hulls, and uh, he had. And it wasn't long at all. He found the material. Uh, he had it forged uh, to the general shape, and then the problem was to grind it down. And he designed a skate, what I, what I call it, what he called it, a skate grinder. It was uh, on a, um, uh, a, a device that, that sloped the exact angle, and the uh, grinding uh, uh, wheel. Uh, and motor would travel on this thing and go up and down and pivot around the center point until that whole surface was ground, ground and polished. And then that big die was put in underwater uh, with with a, a, a flat piece of aluminum. Uh, well, it was really it was it was curved to, to fit one uh, curved dimension and uh, and. And the explosive uh, P, uh, PETN, uh, Primacord, was used as the explosive. And they'd shoot it, and, it, and they'd pull a vacuum underneath it to start with, and then shoot it. And that material, 2014, would go right down into the uh, die. And it was, the problem was solved. And it, and it took a guy from back in the old airplane days to come up with the ideas. Well, I thought that was neat. That's a good story. Yeah. Uh, 
I guess the uh, the other problem uh, was Santa Susana. We, there was no way we could do testing at the S2 stage up there. The transport up there was horrendous. Uh, they had planned to move the, uh, the stage by barge up to Port Wainimi and then haul it overland up into the mountain. Uh, so it was very quickly recognized that was impossible. So Mississippi Test Facility came on and it became the test facility for the S1C and the S2. And I'm not sure whether the S4 well, how did went you down ship there or there? Not. You shipped there by barge, did you? Yes, yeah. Uh, well, actually, no. Um, uh, you're getting ahead of me here. All right. <laughs> it, it, the transportation was definitely one of the problems. But the other problem, another problem was a brand new facility had to be built at Seal Beach. And, of course, it was Navy property. Uh, Corps of Engineers wasn't allowed in, so the Navy did the job for us. They managed the uh, build-up of the facility. Uh, several buildings were built, an engineering building, an assembly building, uh, and uh, it, was, it was quite an endeavor. Well, it was almost done uh, by the time I left the project in 65, uh, but it was, uh, it was a major undertaking. Transportation, uh, we uh, were lucky enough to have uh, available from the Navy LSDs, landing ship docks, and uh, those huge uh, cavernous hulls would take an S2 and a couple of S4Bs. So from uh, Seal Beach, these articles were shipped uh, all the way down to uh, uh, New Orleans. Down through the canal then? Through, oh yes, through the canal uh, to New Orleans, transferred to a, a barge uh, and up to the test site. And after the testing is done, uh, the uh, barge would take them over to uh, the Cape. Uh, all the, the barge, the the LSD, uh, that was all managed by Marshall, uh, and uh, it it worked like a charm. And I think the barges are still operating. Very good. Uh, well, what came next in your career? <laughs> well, uh, I could go on about the S two, but uh, uh, well, my I'm career. Going to come back to the S S two. Uh, along about. Uh, uh, well, I, w I went out to uh, California to the resident office to work with uh, Don Bowden and to uh, head up the project from there during the first year. Uh, Everhart Reese wanted uh, somebody he knew to go out there, so I got elected and went out there for a year. And it was during this period when the, the bulkhead problem was solved. The, uh, uh, we got rid of the Rocketdyne test facility during that period. You were on the site where all this yeah. happened. Yeah. And the design was initiated. Uh, CDR came uh, uh, a couple of years later, uh, but uh, uh, most, most, most of the uh, basic design was done. Where the hard work came afterwards. Anyway, uh, I, was, uh, I came back from that, uh, and uh, uh, the, the project was so big, and I was, <laughs> I was uh, in my early 30s at the time uh, with no real experience in the missile space business like a lot of folks did, had at Marshall. So uh, they put uh, 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 Eric Neubert in as project manager and named me as deputy project manager. But uh, Eric let me r run the project, really, he did. Uh, and, uh, and, and he gave me his guidance until 1965, I got offered uh, an opportunity to go to MIT as a Sloan Fellow, and I picked that one up in a hurry. <laughs> well, did you enjoy the stay at MIT? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was a good experience. And uh, I wrote, a, <laughs> wrote a, uh, a thesis on the subject of, uh, of management of uh, uh, big projects, uh, in an organ matrix organization. That was basically the thesis. Uh, came down in January of uh, 66 to do the research and wrote it in <laughs> until I graduated. Anyway, uh, we came back to Huntsville and uh, uh, they had already named uh, uh, Sam Yarkin to be project manager of the S2. So they put me on the uh, 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 the the budding Skylab program, which uh, 
uh, Lee Ballou was heading up and the AAP and uh, eventually it, uh, we'd, we'd, we came up with the idea of the MDA and uh, the uh, George uh, oh, who, uh, the guy George Miller he was a remarkable guy he came down for one of our meetings reviewing the AAP, the, uh, the, the, and uh, he was looking at the, uh, the, plan, uh, the, the sketches we had for the MDA, and we had four docking ports on the MDA at the time. He says, you need four docking ports for it. You're never going to have four uh, uh, Apollos get up there. So uh, he immediately drew on the, on the chart uh, what it, he, he thought it would look like. One port at the end, one port at the side, and the uh, uh, the Apollo telescope mount on the other side, and that's how it turned out. Is that the sketch? He, that he, he really, signed? sir. Is that the sketch that he signed? Yes, it is. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Lee Ballou was very proud of that. Yes. Uh, that he has the copy of that, the sketch that. Uh, right. Was signed and started the project. Yeah. George Hardy was there at that meeting. Yeah. George George was heading up the MDA at the time. Uh -huh. Anyway, that was uh, <laughs> that was a fun experience too. And then I carry, carried through with the workshop through the whole project, through launch and mission. And uh, Bill Simmons was project manager, and I was deputy. But uh, well, uh, I guess it was 1963. Uh, uh, we went into uh, final checkout at, the, at uh, Huntington Beach. So I went out there for the summer and uh, uh, <laughs> spent the uh, time working with uh, the uh, McDonnell Douglas people on the checkout. Then I got back to Huntsville and they said, you got to go to the Cape. So I went to the Cape and, and stayed with the stage and uh, the, the Skylab workshop until it got launched. And that was a traumatic day. <laughs> yes. Uh, we were we were all uh, seated up, upstairs, and uh, they had us in in one of the um, conference room. And uh, uh, Rocco Patron, uh, I think he was out on the uh, uh, on the launch pad, and, he, and right after the launch, he came in and met with us. And, and uh, there was something wrong, and uh, the solar ray wouldn't extend. Uh, later, we found out the. Uh, uh, meteoroid shield had ripped it, ripped off and ripped the solar ray off. So we came back and uh, we had uh, quite a month coming up with the idea of how to save the Skylab. And uh, of course, you know, they uh, came up with a parasol and then the uh, and then the uh, uh, the fabric shield, uh, which uh, which really saved it. And and the mission went on and. Uh, we had three successful missions. The first one was a little bit hot, <laughs> but uh, uh, everything was accomplished. And eventually it came down with yes. a bang. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> All too well. <laughs> yeah. So we got back from the, uh, uh, the Cape uh, the, and finished up the mission, wondered what to do, and uh, heard that there was a, a, a space telescope being developed. Uh, it hadn't been named Hubble. In fact, it didn't. It wasn't named Hubble until after I had retired in '81. But uh, got on the Hubble, and it, it it went through a long, long definition period. Uh, the uh, 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 Washington quibbled about the design. They quibbled about the funding and. And uh, Bill Keithley headed up the uh, uh, the uh, optical portion of the telescope, and I had the spacecraft portion of the telescope, which eventually uh, resulted in RFPs and SEBs, and that's where I got finally got to be chairman of an SEP. It was on the S2, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, what they call the uh, uh, system support module SSM portion of the space telescope and uh, it was uh, I, I carried it through uh, through the CDR and then uh, an opportunity came up uh, uh, the center announced it had an early out 
possibility for people with a certain amount of service time and uh, and age. Uh, and it was in the summer of good grief, eighty one. Uh, and uh, there was a limited time, and we had to make up our mind before Monday following the Fourth of July. And there I was up on the <laughs> on the side of the house, painting, <laughs> toying in my mind, what should I do? Retire or stay? Retire or stay? And I said, Oh, I have that. I'm going to retire. I retired, got a job uh, with McDonnell Douglas, doing much the same thing when, on Space Lab. Uh, uh, mostly components uh, that uh, Marshall wanted built to support Space Lab. Was that here in Huntsville? Or? That was right here in Huntsville, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, stayed with uh, McDonnell Douglas for 10 years. And one of the last things after we ran out of things to do for Space Lab, uh, the, uh, I got to work on a, uh, with UAH on the development of a uh, 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 well, a patent, a, a means of making co-deposition of three uh, elements along with a ceramic on a uh, piece of metal. And the metal happened to be uh, the stuff that they put in body foot parts. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's an alloy of cobalt, uh, uh, chromium, and molybdenum. And and most of the work was done here at UAH. Uh, in fact, they had a, a, a little a brilliant uh, uh, India, Indian gal uh, who, who headed up that thing. And uh, she, uh, she did a marvelous job. It took a while to, to get to the point where we could uh, uh, make the uh, electric deposition, but it finally did and got a patent. That's... So I had my name on one patent. Good for you. <laughs> Well, after you got through with uh, that, what did you do? Well, I retired from uh, McDonnell Douglas in, uh, I guess it was Jan December 31st, uh, uh, 1993. Uh, no, no, I guess it was 93, yeah. All right. And uh, I had already started to design and build a a place up in uh, North Georgia, a uh, home. And uh, for the next six months, uh, uh, we had somebody else do it, but I was involved in being up there almost every week for several days. Uh, and we, we got it built. And uh, my wife Betty uh, said, uh, she's not taking care of two homes. It's going to be one or the other. <laughs> We moved up there and sold our condo down here and lived up there, I guess, uh, four or five years. And it got pretty lonesome up in the mountains, so we came back home where our kids and grandkids are, at least two of our kids and two grandkids. Let's come back to the, the S-2. Uh, we hear that the current NASA folks are starting to think about the possibility of Reusing it or basing a new vehicle on its design or something of the sort. Do you have any advice for them? Well, if they, uh, I don't think they have any alternative but to use liquid hydrogen and oxygen. And, uh, and the J2 engine uh, uh, worked quite well, although the, uh, uh, the one that uh, uh, Pratt and Whitney built, I guess, what was it called, the A4 or not A4, it was some other designation. Yeah. Uh, it worked like a clock, and that was a beautiful design. But they had some troubles with the uh, uh, with the fuel pumps, uh, developing the fuel pumps in the J2. But they eventually worked them out. But that that J2 worked quite well, and we had engine out capability on the S2. Uh, it could fly and make its mission with one engine out, and that did happen, uh, and it worked. Uh, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> Go with what you got that works, <laughs> and, uh, and and certainly there's going to be modifications. But you, there aren't too many variations that you can go with if you're using oxygen and hydrogen. Do you think the equipment to and the 
materials oh. are still available? To oh, well, we use 2014 T6 on the structure, on the, uh, on the tank structure. And yeah, sure they're available, but I think other other alloys probably are are better at this point in time. Uh, but the the basic configuration the, and the, the the whole concept uh, ought to be a natural. Yeah. Uh, the insulation uh, problem. Bob alluded to it uh, at uh, at one time. I guess when we were talking. Uh, the insulation that the contractor proposed fell out in a hurry. It went out during the time I was out there the first year. Uh, they had proposed a, a, a phenolic shield that would uh, vent helium gas. Helium, of course, will not freeze uh, at the temperature of uh, liquid hydrogen. So they were, they were going to insulate it with, with this, this, this casing of... Uh, a uh, vented uh, helium. Well, there isn't that much helium in the world. <laughs> we'd blow all our, our helium. Uh, we'd be in a bad shape and because we're, we're the, the biggest source for helium. Anyway, uh, it, uh, it fell out and they came up with a foam. And that was developed immediately after I, I left the, the shop out there in 63. And it was a foam uh, applied uh, with uh, a clo closed cell foam, such that the, uh, uh, the liquid hydrogen in the inside of the tank uh, would freeze whatever molecules of, of air, and they use Freon, uh, inside these closed uh, cells. And it formed a vacuum jacket uh, without any uh, manipulation, mechanical or otherwise. It was there. And, and it worked fine. And, until it started to fall off the e-tank and shuttle. <laughs> and that's another problem entirely. That's yeah. another problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the insulation problem was one that got solved by uh, Douglas early on with the S4. They went internal. Uh, they, their internal tank was uh, a, uh, a, a I, I'd call it tri a triangular uh, web. Uh, milled into the skin, and in each one of these little boxes, they would put a, um, uh, a, a, f a fiberglass, if you will, block, and then it would be covered with another piece of fiberglass and coated. Uh, and the theory was, and it worked, was that the liquid hydrogen inside uh, this uh, 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 plastic material would certainly penetrate and get into the matrix where this insulation block was, but you'd have the same effect as we had in the S2, you have a phase of liquid, semi-liquid, and gaseous until you got to the outside when it was fairly, well, fairly warm. Mm -hmm. Not really warm, but fairly warm. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave for the people that are now working at NASA and working in industry, building uh, vehicle to return to the moon? Uh. Yeah, it's something I learned then and it's something that uh, I've learned ever since. Um, innovation, imagineering, comes when you're in your 20s. Hire young people with new ideas and, and let them develop those ideas. That is the biggest lesson I learned. There's something to be said, though, for experience also. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we learn a lot as we grow older, <laughs> and we can share that experience. But the new ideas, we don't come up with new ideas. It's the young people that come up with new ideas. But somebody has to share their experience with them as they do. Sure, so they don't make the same mistakes. Exactly. Did you address that sort of a question in your thesis? No, no. The, the, the thesis had to do with the relationship uh, and the interrelationships uh, of the people working in uh, in the matrix organization, which was Marshall Space Flight Center. The ten labs, the project offices, the support offices, and uh, how we worked together and, uh, and got the job done with some difficulties. Well, if you had to do it all over again, would you follow the same path? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was fun. And 
It was, a, as the astronauts say, it was a ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've surely enjoyed having you here this morning. If you have anything else to add you'd like to put on the historical record, please do so. Well, yeah, I do, although I don't know that you, you necessarily, you may want to cut this off right here. <laughs> but no, I, go ahead. If okay. you have... One of the other things I found out back then, there were a lot of political pressures involved in the in the development uh, of the uh, Saturn and the Apollo. Uh, uh, well, the principal one was the uh, uh, the Kerr Webb McGee Oil Company. Uh, you remember that? Uh, th those were characters that uh, uh, were <laughs> were involved in in the politics and in the uh, uh, provision of funding to get this project started. Uh, Kerr uh, was a senator from uh, uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma yes. uh, uh, at one point, he wanted to get, have the S-2 transferred uh, from North American to uh, Tulsa. Uh, obviously, uh, it would be a feather in his cap. But Oswald Longa, who is our, uh, our boss in the Saturn Systems Office, resisted that fervently. And he said, look, we went through the competition. We found the contractor who had said he could do the job. We want to hold him to it. And we want to keep the engineering force in Downey and go ahead with the project as it was basically uh, proposed. And he won. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sure he, he suffered quite a bit because there was a lot of pressure involved. Uh, the uh, uh, fellow Webb uh, of the uh, uh, the triumvirate Kerr Webb McGee Oil Company became the uh, well he was BOB director at, uh, uh, in Washington previously but uh, he became uh, the administrator and uh, it was a very fortunate choice because he knew how to uh, get the job done in Washington and he did and the uh, the third person McGee you're here now because there's the McGee Oil Company that's building all these rigs that are d drilling oil out in the Gulf and elsewhere in the world. It, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was quite an experience. To, to, I didn't rub, rub shoulders with these guys, but I was very well aware of them. <laughs> Although I did meet uh, Webb and, uh, and uh, oh, who was it? The, uh, T. Keith Lennon was yeah. the administrator before Webb, and, and he made the choice for the S-4 stage. Uh, source selection. Uh, um, oh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, as as president, was a major uh, pusher for the space program, uh, and uh, <laughs> from a political standpoint, he he was masterful uh, <laughs> as he was in anything political. Uh, but he also had a guy by the name of Bobby Baker, who was a staffer from his early days. Yes. And Bobby Baker, and this the, it, it always kind of got to me the way uh, politics works. But Bobby Baker also had an in uh, through his association in Washington, and uh, he had North American put in to all of their plants on the West Coast uh, the, uh, 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 the the beverage and the uh, the automatic machine. Uh, business and it was one company that was put into every one of them and and he was the major benefactor for oh really that's a good well, story well, uh, for, I had for, heard that one for, for other for other reasons he he ended up in jail uh, for <laughs> some, some deal in Texas I don't know what that was <laughs> let's see um, well Oswald Longa my boss uh, on the Saturn Systems office uh, he didn't want the job. Von Braun persuaded him to take it. Uh, I won't use the language that was used, but uh, Oswald took the job and, and did, a, did an excellent job. He, 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 he was a gentleman, let me tell you. Uh, and then on the, uh, on the uh, uh, Space Telescope, which eventually became uh, Hubble, uh, Downey, uh, Jim Downey was head of it. And uh, he was he was an inspiration to work with, uh, and I guess uh, that's about the sum of it. Uh, uh, 
I saw I, I saw politics from a different view than you do as a as a civilian uh, listening to the news tonight. <laughs> well, it's surely been good having you here today, and you've had a remarkable career. And congratulations on that. And thanks. For well, thank again. you. Enjoyed speaking with you.